You're listening to episode six of the Follycast, a book club podcast looking at the Rivers of London series. I'm Margaret and Sutton, and joining me to discuss The Hanging Tree, the latest book in our journey through the series, are... Richard in Fulham. Dan in Worcester. And Jenny in Bath. Yes, you heard that right. Jenny is no longer Jenny in Muswell Hill, but has moved to Bath. So Jenny, did reading The Hanging Tree make you feel more homesick for the bright lights of the capital? Absolutely. Although um, I was in the middle of reading it when London went to tier two and I'm still in a tier one. So, uh, yeah, oh. it, I'm, <laughs> for now. <laughs> um, but it's lovely getting back to London. Really lovely. Um, and uh, there's so many good things about this book. What we're going to do firstly is just um, remind people about what's in the book, because uh, some of our listeners we know aren't necessarily following along. They may have read it a couple of years ago. And it's particularly important with this book, because I know people often um, confuse about what's in this book and the next book, because they're both so action-packed as we build up towards the... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the the, 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 the uh, devastating climax of the first first series of books. So just to remind you that whilst Margaret and I are rereading the series, Jan and Jenny are reading for the first time, as are some of our listeners. So we're not going to discuss spoilers past the books we're reviewing, but we will be discussing major plot points in this book. So if you haven't read The Hanging Tree, it may be best to come back when you have without appearing to be rude. So before we dive in, here's a quick reminder of what is covered in The Hanging Tree. It's arguably the most complex and densely plotted book so far, crammed full of revelations, exposition and showpiece action sequences. The jumping off point for the book is a drug related death at a party of rich teenagers but it gradually becomes apparent that the father of one of the girls present must be the faceless man, last seen grappling with Peter on top of a collapsing tower block. After much detective work and many twists and turns, the faceless man is revealed as the dead girl's father, Martin Chorley. But he and his protege, Leslie May, escape to plot another day. Along the way, we meet Lady Helena, who brings a female perspective to the back history of magic, along with her daughter, Caroline. The latter joins the list of people who have flown to Peter's rescue, literally in this case. Mysterious Americans turn up with Agent Kimberly Reynolds on their tail, and we learn all about the shady American equivalent of the folly. The hunt is on for Reynard Fossman, who has stolen Newton's third Principia from the faceless man, and the book eventually ends up with Lady Helena. We have a series of exciting set pieces, a showdown in Harrods, exploding underground swimming pools in North London, a desperate flight from Martin Chorley's residence, the attempted assassination of Lady Ty, a fight with Leslie at Hyde Park Corner and an eventual explosive showdown in an underground car park beneath One Hyde Park, the most expensive block of flats in London. Many questions are answered, but in true Rivers of London fashion, even more are left hanging. Perhaps that's why it's called The Hanging Tree. What exactly are Martin Chorley and Leslie plotting? How is Mr Punch involved? What role will the Mary Engine, the Third Principia and the Black Library play? Have we heard the last of the Americans? Will Lady Helena and Caroline prove useful allies or rivals? Just how old is Beverly Brook actually? And will Peter heed Lady Ty's warning not to get too involved? And above all, the biggest question has to be how much of this will be answered in the next book, Lies Sleeping. We have returned from London, from the countryside, and now we're back in London. What are your initial thoughts about The Hanging Tree? Yeah, I loved it. I just loved being back in London. Also watching Peter grow and take on more responsibility and he's still getting into the scrapes he's always got into. But it was it was just great to see them them happening on London soil and in places that we all know in London, like Harrods. Also Nightingale was back and uh, really pushing the boundaries. You know, he's there's there's a lot going on and he's right in the middle of it. And the two big things about this book, first of all, the reappearance of Leslie with a real face or faces and and it kind of answered some of the questions that we all had when she disappeared with the faceless man is she is it about fixing her face it seems that um there's more going on in her head with the 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 occupation by Mr Punch of her head still and that's going to be one to watch um I'm glad that 
Peter and Bev are still going strong. The thing, the big thing about this book is how many more magicians we found, wizards, practitioners, specialists, whatever you call them. You know, we had we had like a handful before this book, and suddenly we've got a whole bunch of Americans. There were there were, there were discussions about uh, magic in India. We've got the uh, the Linden Limmers. We've got now a whole bunch of new people and new suspects. So I actually found there are rather too many suspects and rather too much going on in this to hang on to. And also, and I don't know how you guys did it the first time around. I'm beginning to, because we're on book six, I'm beginning to lose touch with what happened in books one to five. So there's lots of more references in this book than before. Yeah. And you have to think, oh my God, when was that? I don't remember that. Well, I, I may be able to help you out there because yeah. um, some of the references are starting to be to the comic books. We're going to come on to that, but uh, we'll also come on to the sheer number of characters. But we, we stick on initial impressions for the time yeah. being. So okay. I think two thumbs up from Jenny. Jan, what did you make of it? Yeah, no, I loved it. I uh, thought it was really dense, as you say. I loved the way that it, I, I've been left with the voice of, of Mr. Punch. And I like the way that it started with Mr. Mm-hmm. Punch and finished with Mr. Punch. Like you, I love the expansion of the characters, you know, Peter being much more involved. I also like this time the humour of Nightingale. So he becomes more of a person, I think, Mm. uh, rather than this just sort of Mm. distant overseer. He obviously trusts Peter much more now. He has much more confidence in his ability to deal with things while still acknowledging that he's still got a long way to go. All this sort of the magic side now has become normalised, hasn't it? So that, you know, everybody involved, they're not just talking or questioning what's going on. They're accepting that some want to get involved a bit more, like Gulid has has got involved, um, whether she wants to or not. And the others, there are still lots of characters in the police that are, acknowledge that it's real what's going on but they don't really want to get involved and also interestingly I think the two sides were almost colliding at one point and Peter was having to explain that yeah we are going to expand and you can have confidence that we'll be able to do our job because we've got all these other people involved and yeah I think uh, the relationship between Peter and Bev is quite well established now and I've, I've been dying for the appearance of Leslie so I was very happy to have her back. I really like the fact that Nightingale was far more in it than he has been in any of the other books thus far and that really added to the plot I think and my other thing I really liked about the book was the fact that Khalid who appears very briefly in uh, book two is so prominent throughout this book I think she's a really great character. Compared to Foxglove Summer, which was quite slow and lyrical, this had everything on almost the kitchen sink in. And also, bar a few minor characters, I think pretty much everybody that we've met and encountered appeared in some way or other. And the other thing I would say is I felt there was a better balance between the rivers and the forces of magic. I felt this was a more even book. Halfway through, I was thinking, actually, this probably is my favourite book. Yeah, up to now, I've been fairly clear that Broken Homes was my favourite. I think for reasons we'll talk about later on, towards the end, it fell back to being my second favourite book. Not not wanting to create lists. Or <laughs> it's, the way, it's the way I work. I so, nevertheless. Um, its denseness is its strength and its weakness. I love the fact that you've got so much going on. On the other hand, there was a particular sequence where they firstly find out all about the American branch of chasing the supernatural. And then we get the back history of the whole female history of magic, which was fascinating. But at that point, I think my head's about to explode. I'm getting so much new information imparted to me. Yeah. And also the strength of the books and I wouldn't change it at all, the fact that the, they're all in the first person. They have to be. It, it really works well. The downside of that is that Peter has to meet people to tell him things. If you think, uh, if this was in the third person, we would probably early on encounter Lady Helena, and then we'd encounter the Americans before they set off across the Atlantic, and then they would dovetail with yeah. them. Whereas here, 
because of the first person narrative, we meet the Americans, then we have to find out in retrospect who they are, where they've come from, what their history is. Yeah. So that would that would that that be my only criticism. I mean, there's so many locations. Listen to Dean who worked on that map for the, the last book is actually putting the finishing touches on a map for this book to coincide with the podcast. Hopefully I'll put a link in the show notes. I've seen a first draft of it and then it just brings it home, home how many different locations yeah. there are in this book. And particularly I like the fact it's focused at the start and the end about around one Hyde Park because pre lockdown, my main route into London was the 14 bus, which went straight past one Hyde Park so I saw it the, the site demolished and it gradually growing over the years and I'm pretty sure at some point I would have been reading an earlier book in the series yeah. being built as I went past and wondering what the hell are they doing there <laughs> yeah so, me too well when I'm in London I stay at the other end of Sloan Street so that's often the way when I'm going for a walk or a run uh, in Hyde Park, that's the route I would take. So very familiar to me too. Yeah. Yeah, the, the bottom floor of it, when last time I went past, it seemed to be full of expensive car dealerships. Yes, yeah. Maseratis and Maseratis. Ferraris and stuff, yeah. We met, talked about the number of characters. A friend of Jenny and I's, um, Richard, from the band Cutwater, who also uh, provides the, our theme tune, uh, just finished Moon Over Soho, so he's running a bit behind. And he okay. said he really enjoyed it, much more than the first book, but he said he was a bit overwhelmed by the number of characters. And I remember thinking at the time, you, you ain't seen nothing <laughs> yet. <laughs> How did you feel about the number of characters and the, the roles that they were playing? I mean, certainly for me, if there's a collective noun for female teenagers, it would be a confusion of teenagers. Because <laughs> Phoebe, Caroline, Christina, Oliver. I was ha luckily in Kindle. You can tap a name, and it tells you when they first appeared. So I was able to tap Christina and say, "Okay, now I know who that is." But was that a bit of a challenge? Um, yes, uh, but then, I, but then it had to be there. You know, you're talking about teenagers at a party. If you have too few of them, you think, "Well, what kind of party is that? Who would want to go to that party?" So, so I understood why they were there. I think the, the difficulty, or not a difficulty, but kind of being thrown more and more and more magicians or wizards <laughs> when you thought there were quite relatively few of them, and that was the issue. They were all wiped out in Ettersburg. Where have all these people come from? Mm. It's just, you know, there's so many of them and so many people hunting them that it's beginning to get out of hand. And also, I, because of that, I was getting slightly confused about the role of the Linden Limmers because they are, well, they're trying to do the same thing as, as Nightingale and the Fully and acquire mm. Jonathan Wilde's ledger. Incidentally, I've called a character in my new book, Jonathan Wilde, because because he's a, he is a oh, bit of a... Ah. Bastard, so he can be thief taker as well as... Um, mm. Yeah, I've, I think it is it is now quite hard to keep in my head who all the magicians are and what yeah. their special skills are and what they've stolen and who they're following and uh, that is quite hard and it's also i think trying to keep in your head their different skill levels yeah so you know some seem to be able to counteract an attack as I thought at certain times, oh, right, that one's been seen off now. We won't see that character again. And, and then, you know, the next chapter, oh, they're back. It felt like a bit of a romp, actually. I, I did enjoy it. All the, the girls from St. Paul's, I eventually got them figured out who was who. I agree with both what Jan and Jenny have said in that, yes, there are a lot of magicians and there are a lot of characters. All the themes of the books are coming together because you've got uh, Faye and the Demimonde and all those characters. And then you've also got the Rivers and then you've got all these magicians and you've got the Americans. You've also, um, as she's mentioned, got all these fathers floating around as well. So I wonder whether that's because they needed so many characters to sort of tie it all together and you're constantly looking at, who is the faceless man and where is the faceless man? And it's almost like he's hiding in plain sight. But there's so much confusion and so many characters that perhaps that's the deliberate thing that uh, Ben Aranovich decided to do. think it tries to cram too much in uh, do you think that's detrimental to the structure of the book 
I mean, there could be a danger that the further we get into the series, we have so much action, and then occasionally it's just interspersed with major dumps of information. What do we all think about pace and structure and level of information and action that we're getting? Because I think that the structure of the book... I was particularly interested in this time. Listeners who've been listening to all five podcasts may well do a drinking game, which is uh, <laughs> you, you, you have a drink the first time Richard mentions TV shows. Of all the books, this to me seemed like one series of a TV show crammed into a book in terms of the pacing, in the sense that you, if you think about it, you've got effectively five showpiece sort of action sequences, which if this was a five part TV show, the climax of episode one would be the showdown in Harrods. The climax of episode two would be the showdown with the Americans and Phoebe and the, the house with the swimming pool. Then we'd be on to Martin Shawley's rectory and the fight through the forest and the coming to the rescue there. Then you've got the assassination of Ty, or the attempted assassination and the, the flooding of Curzon Street. And then finally, you've got the big showdown at One Hyde Park. Yeah. And between those, you've got exposition, explanation, investigation. It's, it's quite an interesting structure that is like TV writing. You know, you've got your beats, you know, your big set pieces every 60 pages or so. As a structure for a book, I'm not sure you could start a series like that, if you see what I mean. I think you can only do that because the characters are all there and on the chessboard able to be moved about. Yeah, I agree. That's a great point. Yeah, I think that's true. I think that's true that all those major characters have been firmly established and developed throughout the series and more of them came back into this book like Kittredge and Kimberly who have featured quite slightly in previous books but I think I think it's it's firmly established now especially now you know that there are international branches of things like the folly yeah um, the the October man which is a novella is all about the German equivalent of the folly oh. so the series is quite literally world building as we go along with lots of space to include offshoots and catch-up stories and spin-off stories and stuff like that. Yeah, I, I, I mentioned it before. I think the, the thing that probably stopped it being my favourite was about half to two-thirds of the way through when Operation Cart Horse, which is the hunt for Leslie May, Operation Wentworth, which is the <laughs> board investigation, and Operation Tinker, which is the murder inquiry. And all these operations yeah. are twining around each other. And literally, I did feel a bit headachey at that point. done very well not to talk about Leslie thus far but it does seem apparent that she isn't undercover for the police or a reluctant accomplice she is a full-on badass villain how do we feel about her character arc now Jan you go first okay so I'm still not completely sure where she is you know how much is it, she's being controlled by what's happened previously. Do you remember the, the part mm. when they, they got into her head? And, and then references at the end, Mr Punch and Peter talking to Mr Punch. I'm thinking, oh, is it still that Leslie is good really and she's still being controlled? So that would explain her sort of quite violent behaviour at times. I can't believe, because Martin Chorley seems so appalling. I still find it hard to believe that Leslie is a, a really convinced ally of his because of the Leslie that we got to know at the beginning, unless she's gone through a complete transformation. So I still find her role quite intriguing. And also, I remember quite early on when she made her appearance, and Peter was quite irritated by this, Beverly actually said to him, Perhaps she's trying to tell you something. So I didn't know if that was a hint. And clearly, Leslie is still trying to, while fighting with Peter, she's also clearly trying to protect him as well, as Martin Chorley made that clear. I, I love the way she reappeared, though, just getting into that seat next to Peter in Harrods Cafe. It yeah. was a kind of ah! moment. Yeah. It's really interesting about Leslie's face because obviously he recognises in Harrods, but when he sees her at Hyde Park, it's her walk 
that he recognises. He doesn't recognise her at all. So again, she could have been around a lot more, but he may not have recognised her. I don't know. The other thing I think is interesting about Leslie is that she's only in two scenes. So she probably only takes up about 10 or 10 pages of the book. But it's so, so, so important in terms of her role. And yeah, I think there's that whole thing about she has this ambivalent thing going on because obviously, as Jan mentioned, Martin Chorley says, I can't touch you. I've been told I can't hurt you by Leslie. So again, we just don't know quite the extent to how committed she is to the project and how she's sort of torn by her past as well. The other interesting aspect here is that Gleed, who has actually been on the cover of our podcast since the first podcast, (laughs) none of you commented on who's that other person. That's who it is. And obviously she's very clearly part of the team. What, What do you think she brings to the books she's very grounded she's very self-sufficient she's a a hard worker intuitive so she's she's bringing a lot of skills that aren't necessarily peter's because she's also very familiar with how this thing works you know she doesn't try to get around the rules she tries to apply the rules as best she can to whatever the situation is but she's she's a good sidekick to both him and Nightingale, actually. So I think she's uh, extremely valuable. And she's also willing, she, she's not somebody who is desperate to be the kind of top dog or anything. So when her, her role is often to be, can you just not come in yet? You know, can you just hang around here and make sure nobody goes in? And that's, she does that without question. She knows her own mind as well, because, you know, when Nightingale gives her the option to opt out of a dangerous situation, you know, she just sort of states quite clearly, uh, no, you know, I'm going to yeah. I need to be here. So I think, yeah, I think she's a very impressive character. Seawall, having obviously seen what happened with Leslie, who was his former protege, does very clearly say to Peter, I'm making you personally effing responsible for making sure nothing weird happens to her. If you can't guarantee that, I want your boss down here to do the job instead. It's also referred to that Gleed was one of Sewell's favoured few, one of his Valkyries. All right. Yeah, um, yeah. He's clearly got an eye on, you know, not another person going uh, over to the dark side. <laughs> I have to say, I think Galid is one of my favourite characters. I think she's got a brilliant sense of humour. She's hardworking. She has a similar trait to Leslie, is that she is a member of the police that's prepared to do all the hard work, the groundwork, the grunt work. She's quite brave. She's quite fearless. She rescues Peter a number of times. She's also quite open to what's going on at the Folly and prepared to go with it. She goes to the Chestnut Tree pub with him, which is quite interesting. She meets the Chinese swordsman, which again, I think is a lovely touch. And I really, really like the fact that Perhaps because of what happens in book two and the scene at Dr. Moreau, I think I've spent a long time waiting for her to have a really big role and I'm really, really pleased about that. Jenny mentioned there are a few things that had her scrambling back thinking, I don't remember that happening. Before this book, we've had three graphic novels. They're not essential to read and we are planning to talk about them, um, not least because we'll be running out of books in two months' time, the main novels. The three of them, and they are, they are they're referenced quite a lot, but what I'm intrigued is whether they're referenced in a way that you think, oh, that's just something we haven't seen. You know, because often books do talk about, you know, there there is assumed to be other things going on than just what you see in the books. But there's three references. I don't know if you pick them up at different points to the thing with the haunted cars. Yes. The BMW. That was was the first point at which I went, I don't remember anything about haunted cars. Yeah, well, that's the first graphic novel, which is called Bodywork. And is about haunted cars. I won't say anything more than that. There's also reference to the thing with the mould, and that's a book called Black Mould. Um, And again, I won't give away the plot, but Galid is very clearly Peter's partner in that book, much more than before she is in the actual novels. So there's an Mm -hmm. element to which their familiarity with each other, she almost is more prominent in the graphic novels. And, you know, works very well in the graphic novels because obviously with a hijab on. And so it, it, it's interesting that that happens. But also, and this is something I picked up on the Rivers of London Facebook group, is that there's also a reference to something that no one knows what it's a reference to. It says, don't forget the business at the Royal Botanical Gardens in Kew. And 
That's obviously going to go in the prequel. There's also the most obscure Doctor Who reference you probably didn't even pick up where Peter refers to something as being a crinoid. Um, which oh, no, was, I, I definitely yeah, didn't pick that, that up. That was the 1976 Doctor Who episode about evil plants taking over human beings. You mentioned Lady Helena earlier and that whole branch of wizardry, if if that's the right right way to put it, but certainly practitioners, anyway, Mm. is probably a better way to put it. What do you think that information adds to what we already know? I couldn't quite work out, actually, how important they were. I think what they they were able to tell us was a, a bit of the background of, not the current faceless one, but the faceless one before that. Um, which is quite important. Also, they raised a question in my head, which is what happened to Bavara? Was she not, was she not at the folly? So she's with... still at the folly? Well, uh, that's I don't where, know. That's where graphic novel volume two, The Night Witch, will be. Uh, oh, okay. Be. <laughs> One thing I did like about the characters, uh, I thought it had a slight echo of Nightingale and Peter's relationship in that Caroline was obviously clearly trying to do a bit of experimentation on her own, feeling yeah. that she could take the magic in different directions in the same way that Peter has also tried to take shortcuts yeah. um, successfully and unsuccessfully. I thought that was quite interesting. And with them up in the tree, that reminded me of Roald Dahl's The Twits. <laughs> <where's-> <laughs> They've got all the birds up in the tree. But I thought that was um, had a slightly comical element that yeah. didn't quite ring with all the other awful things that were going on, that they were yeah, blown up and hiding in the tree. Particularly when they're playing Angry Birds, waiting. Yes. <laughs> You're right, the, the parallels are particularly apparent when they're at the pub and Nightingale and Lady Helena have gone in and their two sort of understudies are waiting outside and you just hear noises of a fight going on inside. And they, <laughs> uh, reading it this time, I was actually struck by, bear with me, it's a strange parallel, the, 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 the parallels with um, women's football. There was a point in World War I when, because of the, the, the men being away and because of the women being together working in munitions factories for the first time, that women's football was far more popular than men's football. And that actually continued after World War I, and they were getting much bigger crowds than men's football. I didn't so, know that. The, so the men didn't know that. that. There's a really great documentary. I'll, I'll try and find the name of it. And I'll put a link in the show notes. But basically what happened is the men shut it down. They, they actually made women's football illegal to pay to watch women's football. And it was just shoved under the carpet for 60 years, basically. And until the last decade or so. I saw some parallels when they set up the, the Society of the Rose, which is like, like the forerunner of the folly. And then, mm-hmm. it, then as, as Lady Helena says, as soon as they got a whiff of respectability, they couldn't dump the women fast enough. Yeah. The men moved into their brand new clubhouse on Russell Square and slammed the door in the face of the women following behind. I quite like that idea that mm-hmm. there is a backstory as to why up to now the practitioners we've seen have been men. I also want to posit here two quite interesting things about Caroline as well, the daughter. First of all, that Peter had come across before as the cleaner at County Guard. And I think that's quite interesting that they're aware of the faceless man or maybe just in terms of the level of magic that's going on and the sort of interconnectedness of it. But also there's an interesting plot point when they compare watches. And I was thinking, why are they doing this? And it was all to do with, again, about the magic destroying mobile phones and the importance of having a really good watch that wouldn't do that and then their watch is an important plot point because that's when Peter later on realises that the faceless man is Martin Shirley when he sees his watch. So this is um, arguably the most self-contained Sorry, this is arguably the least self-contained book <laughs> so far. There are lots of twists and turns, but to use a gymnastic analogy, do you think it really sticks the landing? Is, is the ending of it as satisfying as some of the other books, or are we in a Empire Strikes Back scenario where it's as much about waiting for the next book as the end of this one? I think it's very much about waiting for the next book because we, we still don't have the faceless one, we still don't have Leslie, and we still don't have the ledger. 
because Lady Helen's got it. And I don't know whether, mm. I don't know what will happen to that. So I think it leaves a lot of things open. But what I think it does is gather together all the right people to make sure that it does get fixed. So there's an awful lot of people who have been working in this book and helping them to, to progress the case against Chorley, to identify him. And, uh, and some of them are regular police, some of them are uh, Americans, some of them are the security services, but I think they're all kind of, there's, there's now an agenda. There is now this, we've got to do this, we've got to get this guy. And they're all on board with it. So this book has brought them all together. Yeah, I think that's a good way of, of summing it all up. Yeah, I think we're all set for the next one. One thing I found unexpectedly satisfying was the bit where Lady Ty had her chat to Peter mm. right at the end, really laying it out, what the relationship, his relationship with Beverly, um, what that's going to mean. And sort of almost like saying they're a good match but warning him off and saying, look, this is not going to go well for you long term. So that was a sort of quite a human side with all the magic yeah. and the excitement going on that brought you back to the reality of this relationship that's, you know, that's obviously very well established now. But I, I think she's also saying it's not going to go well for Bev either, because Bev, Bev is going to be in the same position that Lady Ty is. She will outlive her children, her grandchildren, and everybody she loves. Yes. It's a very yeah. difficult thing. Yeah, I, I agree that um, it's a fairly satisfying ending in the sense that we now know who the faceless man is. We now know that there's a whole cast of characters to support Peter and Nightingale in trying to defeat him. We still are not sure what's going to happen to Leslie, but I do like that sort of calming down bit at the end, that it didn't just finish in the car park, that you had that conversation with Ty and Peter about Beverly, which was desperately sad in a way, that she will outlive her children. And you begin to see that she does have some sympathy and warmth towards Peter, and they're not just sort of fighting each other or, you know, that there is the beginning of a relationship between them in terms of her looking out for him as well. And as I say, I do like the whole Mr Punch bit at the end as well. So I found it fairly satisfying and it landing at the end, but obviously you want to know what's going to happen next. I, mean, I think you're a fan of Lady Tide, Jam. Is, is this what you've been waiting for? Lots of yeah, them? yeah. No, I thought I thought it was great, and she it obviously right from the word go. Um, it explained how much power she wields because you know, reminding straight away of you know, I rescued you from underground and you made a promise. So Peter didn't even question really. He knew he'd got to go and do something, and Nightingale more or less sanctioned it so knew that that she was influential and I think there's a lot more going on behind the scenes that we led we led to believe here than's actually been explained so I think she seems very dismissive of other people but I think towards the end when she was talking to Peter I thought that very sort of almost human side that she had yeah. concerns for her for her younger sister and also reflections on the way her own life had turned out. No, it did. It did. It did, it did kind of round her, didn't it? It did. Um, yeah, she's she, and she's just got so many more connections than you realise. Okay, so I'm going to drop something of a spoiler now. Um, the first seven books seem to form a self-contained unit with Lies Sleeping, which is coming up next as the effective season finale. So let's speculate about what's coming next. What plot elements are you most keen to see resolved? I really want to know about Leslie. I really am dying to know how much she has gone over to the dark side or how much she's in control of actually what she's going of what of what she's doing and what's going on so i'm very keen to find out about that also yeah the ledger so i can't quite decide whether you know the pursuit of it in this book is as important as it seems at the beginning because nightingale almost dismisses it at the end as if oh well i think it's fine if lady helena she's in a better position to interpret it so i don't know whether that's just going to be parked or whether it's going to be significant in the next book margaret and i were playing the friends game 
Friends episode titles are always the one with, you know, and if you were trying to sum yeah. up all the complexity of this book as the one with, what would the one with be? And it wouldn't be Dead Girl, Imagine. One Hyde Park. It's not the no. one with uh, the Mary Engine or the Principia. It's the one where we find out about who the faceless man actually is. There's lots of things hanging around. So we've got the Principia, which is about, you know, turning base metal into gold in theory, which is something Newton was obsessed with as a way of solving the personal finances. I don't know if that's something that Rishi Sunak is going to have to resort to if the way things, <laughs> things are going. I, well, my, my favourite character in, the, in all of the books is Nightingale. And so Nightingale is going to have the battle of his life, I guess, in the next book against the faceless man, the faceless one. He missed a punch by the sound of it. Yeah, exactly. So I just hope he comes out of it okay. Yeah, I think lots to look forward to yeah. in the next one. So that's what we thought about The Hanging Tree. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please send us feedback by email to at follypodcast at gmail.com or leave a comment on our website, thefollycast.com. We have had some questions from listeners about whether we're going to review the graphic novels, the novellas and the short stories. And yes, we will be covering those once we finish the first eight books. Whilst we wait for book nine, which, if you follow Ben on Twitter, you'll know he started writing three weeks ago, as we record this in October 2020. So, in the next episode, we'll be looking at book seven, Lie Sleeping. The Follycast theme you've been hearing is London is Inspired by Cutwater, and links to their site are in the show notes. Thanks for listening, and see you in our next episode. Mm-hmm.